YouAreAWarrior.com, an online social networking site for people who are dealing with life-altering issues or everyday troubles, not suffering science, silence. So it's not just about cancer, it's about whatever you're going through, whether it's diabetes, obesity, feeling lonely, depressed, divorce. You know, we as black women and men really don't have outlets to go to. We sort of suffer in silence and we get angry and we, we're, we're mad and we're mad at the world. But I, I said, where do you go to when you're dealing with all of this struggle? Now you can go to youarewarrior.com, <laughs> the outlet. Um, and from that, I started a, a jewelry line. I am a warrior, inspirational. So my whole life is about embracing who you are as a warrior because the mind can empower you or enslave you. Mm. And I beat cancer, thank, thank glory to God and myself, because I let the mind empower me and said, I'm a warrior, I'm beating it. And that's what I Good did. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cheryl Wills. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've been uh, with New York One for 22 years. Oh, wow. Holding it down wow. as an anchor, a reporter, and it's funny, four years ago, I found out something that superseded. I never thought anything would supersede my ambition to be an anchor. But four years ago, I did some research and found out, as you said when you presented me with the award, that my great-great-great-grandfather, Sandy Wills, I learned he was purchased on a slave auction block. Oh, wow. By Edmund Wills, which is why I'm still Cheryl Wills 150 years later. And the National Archives sent me all of his information. And it blew my mind. Not only his information, but I learned about his wife, a phenomenal woman who was also a slave, Emma Wills. She's my great, great, great grandmother. When I learned their stories, everything changed. Everything changed because now I had a different focus, a different vision, and a different reason for sitting and reporting the news to you every day. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not just telling you what happened. I'm kind of telling you with a wink why it happened and how we're going to change it. Mm, and I'm that. also more <clears throat> empowered to embrace, especially, this is why I'm here today. See, I see a lot of my colleagues are not here, and that's a shame in the mass media, because we should be among our sisters. You know, once you make it, the same bridge that brought you up can bring yeah. you right back down. Oh, sure. You can't be too good to be around people. You can't only go to Fifth Avenue and all the fancy affairs. You also got to be with your sisters and mm -hmm. make your presence known. So when I learned how my great-great-great-grandmother, Emma, struggled after her Civil War husband died and fought the federal government for her pension, and they sent me the documents with her X on it, signing her name in an X, a fire lit under me. Mm. You want to have church, we can have church. <laughs> fire, exactly. I'm telling you, to the point where now I, it's a whole new game. It's a whole new game. I am committed to supporting our sisters and brothers. I am committed to really understanding why we're here. I heard a lot of people talk about white privilege. We have a privilege too. We have a serious privilege because we have ancestors that invested in us for hundreds of years with no pay. If that's not a privilege, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to reap the harvest and stop going into the mass media and begging somebody. Who are you begging anybody for? You have a right to be at the table just like exactly. everybody else. Exactly. And a dear, dear price was paid for you to be at that table. So that's what I'm about, y'all. <laughs> Can we get an amen? I That's love it. I love it. You know, Flo. I love it. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And Ms. Flo Anthony. Hi, I'm Flo Anthony. I'm actually here today in support of uh, my soror and protege, Ms. Geneva Thompson. Her receiving a Black Women in Media Award today. I'm very, very proud of all of the accomplishments that Geneva has made in such a short period in her mm -hmm. career. She's got a huge career ahead of, of her. Um, I, um, I guess I'm a real pioneer. I guess I'm the oldest person in the whole building. No. <laughs> but no. I am uh, the 
Yeah, I kind of started this whole entertainment reporting for black women thing. I'm the first uh, African American woman or black woman uh, ever at the New York Post in the sports department, yeah. the entertainment department. <laughs> Uh, I spent 10 years at the New York Post, and um, I went on from there. Currently, I host a daily syndicated radio show with Super Radio that goes out to 4 million people daily. I write a weekly column that appears in many um, uh, black newspapers in New York City, the New York Amsterdam News. Mm -hmm. I'm still in the mainstream media. I'm a, a contributor to the um, New York Daily News confidential column. Uh, in addition to that, I also write a monthly column for Resident Magazine. Uh, I can be seen often on TV One on Life After. Mm -hmm. Last week I was on um, the Hollywood Unsung, What's Happening. I used to live with Haywood Nelson, and he asked me oh, to do the show to speak up for him. And most recently, I am a best-selling author of Black Expression of Deadly right. um, And I have also lived 29 years uh, cancer-free, which is a wonderful thing. I uh, have a little scare going on now, but uh, you know, I've just gotten out the hospital last week. But you know, as you said, I'll beat it again. It's not yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's wonderful to see all of you young women, right. you know, uh, such as Neva and everyone coming up in the media as, as you're doing and, and working very, very hard. A few things that were said earlier I didn't quite agree with. I believe, you know, as Cheryl was saying just now, all of our predecessors, uh, my mentor, the great Ophelia DeBoer, who right. passed away three weeks ago, I mean, they, they struggled, they were there right. fighting, they weren't just saying we're just going to be present. They were there right. and they paved the way for all of us, the, the great Trudy Haynes uh, in Philadelphia, the first on-air um, newscaster yes, and weather woman, yep. she came out to a book sign of mine in Philly the other week. So, you know, we are here standing on all of their shoulders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I think it's very important for all of you to realize that. Amen. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Flo. Thank yes. you for joining. Yes. And, and I guess many of us want to know, since you've had tenured careers and what you do, how did you even get your start? Um, did you start in the newsroom? Did you start in news? And I know you're an entrepreneur, entrepreneur life coach. Mm -hmm. How did you get your start and what you're doing? Do you want Okay. Well, uh, um, well, I started, you know, that's so funny. Both of us went to Syracuse University, oh. Newhouse. So started in communications um, and worked at NBC, but I've always wanted to be in media mass communications. So I've always been a writer. Uh, I found my way to where I am actually. I was an actress writer in New York City um, and sold my first screenplay. And I was a, you know, I was a bartender trying to make my way. And I said, you know what? Why am I work making money for the white man? Make money for myself. You know what? I need to open my own restaurant. You know, everyone told me I couldn't do it. Right. I was too young. Right. I was African American mm. in Manhattan. You know what I mean? It's mm. a white man's world. It's you, there was only about one or two women owning restaurants, um, and people told me I couldn't do it. But then, you know, I knocked on every door, called every landlord, and the seventh time I got my restaurant. It was called Haven on 51st Street. Um, I sold it seven years later. And then I started getting into my journey of what I really wanted to do. And I realized after getting the breast cancer that I really wanted to inspire and help people and turn, turn what I have been through to make it a purpose for us black women because people always say we sh we're not good enough, we shouldn't be on, at the table, but we, we are good enough and we should be on the table. And we should be around the table on it and on top of the table. <laughs> because I, like, I, I'm tired of hearing that, you know what, we're not smart enough, we're not good enough, you know, there, there should only be one black in the room. That is so not true. If you start changing the way you think and realize that you're supposed to be there, right. you will be there. You know what, we have to take that out of the, of the picture That's saying right. that we're not supposed to be there or let me sneak in or, you know what, start thinking that it is our time. Mm -hmm. Right now, I love seeing all these black women in panels on television and everything because it is our time That's and right. we need to support each other. We need to help each other. We need to be tweeting about Cheryl Wills, Brashawn Shaw That's and right. Flo Anthony. Everybody, instead of, it's not me, 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 it's us. If we start thinking us, then we'll rise to the top, That's keep rising right. to the top. So I started this URWarrior.com. It's an online social networking site. Yes, I'm going to be Brashawn Shaw, the black woman founder of a social networking site. Blow Mark Zuckerberg out the park. <laughs> <laughs> because I think like that.
like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's time that we change the way we think. And right. with that, I, I'm using my life coaching. I do online workshops and wow. I speak at panels and things like that. Just about empowering yeah. people, empowering us. Mm -hmm. Because it's our time and it's time for us to get together mm -hmm. and stand up. Yes. We rise. Awesome. Thank you, Brashawn. Yeah. And for Cheryl and Flo. I started out in nine, right after I graduated from Syracuse. My first job out of college was at Fox 5 as a news assistant. And I was making below minimum wage because those of you in the news business know when you start out, they pay you below rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And I did it with a joy because I knew where I wanted to go. And I, I know we're here to give advice. And I would say to anyone who wants to uh, be an anchor or a reporter, Remember, you have to start small. Nobody's going to look at you out of school just because your mama told you you were great, you know, and all of our mothers tell us that. You're not going to make the leap from graduating from school to being on an anchor set. And it's amazing to me how often I meet young women who are like, well, I'm ready for the air. And I'm like, not yet, you know. <laughs> Get, you know, cut your teeth, like this sister was saying in her agency. Cut your teeth, be mentored, and then work your way. And some people actually think they're above being an assistant, probably, and rightly so. You just spent 200 grand being educated. You're ready to get it on, you know. But you still do have to start from the bottom mm -hmm. and then work your way. That's how you really get the credibility and the respect as, we, as you progress in your career. But to make those, you know, I, I know a lot of people who have been parachuted to the top of the mountain because of who they know, because they're, they have the look, it don't last long. Mm -hmm. It don't, a family connection, you've seen it a lot too, Flo. Mm -hmm. It doesn't last long. Mm -hmm. And when you tumble down, there's nobody to catch you. Mm -hmm. Because nobody will respect you because you didn't pay your dues. So I would suggest to everyone here who's trying to get to the anchor set or the reporter's uh, field, start as a news assistant, assignment reporter, assignment editor, whatever, and just get there, make connections. I want to acknowledge our weather, our traffic anchor, Naomi Yanni, is here from New York One. And she's a beautiful sister from the Congo, born in the, her family's from the Congo, which I just think, she's so stunning, and she's such a bright, beautiful presence on New York One. So uh, that's how I started, and then I did the news assistant thing for three years, and then New York One was starting in 92, and someone literally came over and said, you work so hard, you know, doing this crap job. Do you want to come over with this new concept? New York One, for those of you, you know, it's been on 22 years, and now it's an institution, but when it started, for those of you who remember, mm -hmm. everyone was like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I know you remember it well. We were doing it all by ourselves, you know? And I said, absolutely. So, and then as it grew, I grew along with it. So I would say to anyone, when someone comes at you, there's a lot of entrepreneurs in here, don't laugh at them, because you don't know where they're going to end up. I already have some of your cards in my pocket. I never say no. I'm like, okay, because I don't know what you're going to blossom into. True. The person like this sister, with determination, you can't be stopped. So that's what I would advise. Start from the bottom, work your way to the top. Mm -hmm. Well, my career actually started in sports. Um, I always wanted to be a sports um, reporter. Sports is still probably more my forte than the gossip and the entertainment, but the gossip and the entertainment for some reason made money, whereas sports didn't. I had one time had my own sports magazine because I've always been an entrepreneur. Right. That's a, sometimes I like to call it an entrepreneur. <laughs> 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 and I, I started another one called Sport and Joe. But at any rate, I was writing a, uh, a sports column for the Black American newspaper called Keep Punching. And the New York Post at that point wanted to hire an African American woman as an agate clerk. And so I was contacted uh, by the late uh, Dean Memminger, you worked at the Sun at New York One, uh, by him about it. 
and um, I went for the interview. I did get the job, uh, but I failed as the agate clerk. Now, the agate clerk is when you see all those boxes at night and all the scores. I mean, I used to have to stay there at 2 o'clock in the morning to wait for the Vancouver Canucks or the Lakers scores. I finally got a little smart. Instead of waiting for AP to send it over, started calling the team. <laughs> I did. I started calling the team. PR people directly, but uh, they said, you know, you're not doing well at this, um, so we're going to move you. We see that you've got a degree in fine arts. We're moving you to the entertainment department. So I went kicking and screaming and hollering. I failed the whole mm. black community. They kept saying, but Flo, it's a daytime job. Right. It's better pay. Right, 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 right. <laughs> it's right. a better job. So when I got to the entertainment department, at first, I did all the schlock jobs there. I was an editorial assistant, mm -hmm. as Cheryl was saying. Like, I started with the sports. I started with the agate clerk right. thing. Right. Even then, though, I did break some stories. When um, uh, the Chicago Bears were at the Super Bowl, I had a friend on the team, and he said one night that Jim McMahon had been fined $5,000 for uh, painting a Adidas logo mm -hmm. on his headband. They put that on page six of the post mm -hmm. when I hung up and said it. So, even then, I was breaking stories. So when I went to the entertainment department, I did the um, theater guide, the movie guide, clock, uh, the TV grid. We got they paid me an extra fifty dollars a week to do the TV grid. Mm. Uh, I mean everything schlock job you could do. And then um, Spike Lee did She's Got to Have It. So I asked uh, the editor. I said, Can I write a story? about that, I think I can get Tracy Camilla Johns. He said, you really think you can get the interview? I said, yeah. So they said, okay. So I wrote that story. And then uh, when Jermaine Jackson, because I've had a long affiliation, as most of you all know, with the Jackson family, he came into town to um, perform at the Apollo. And I said, well, can I do a story? They said, you really think you can get the interview? I said, yeah, I think I can get the interview. So I wrote that story. And so all of my, my profiles started to build. At that time, I didn't know they were supposed to be paying me 300 bucks per story since mm -hmm. I was an editorial assistant. But my friend in the art department said, you need to ask mm -hmm. about that. So then I did, and I got that all retroactively. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just kept breaking story after story after story. And then I started to give Cindy Adams um, a tip that she's like my mentor. And Richard Johnson uh, was leaving the post at that time to go work for Robin Leach. And there was going to be a position open over there on page six, not the lead like he was, but a position open. And so I said, you know, I'm not even I'm going to go over there. I'm not going to going away party because I had applied other times to go to page six, and he had totally ignored me. Well, at the same time, I had this black sports magazine, Gladiator, and I was using right. everybody at the post to work on it. In fact, they said, Flo, you're taking the free and freelance a little too far. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I was so tired, I answered the phone in the entertainment department, Gladiator. I said, <laughs> so, as I said, I'm breaking all these stories, and Steve Cuso, who's still the managing editor of the Post, called me in his office and said, close the door. I said, oh, Lord, it's a union job, but they still going to fire me because I got the Gladiator. I mean, oh, God, where's the union rep to help me out? And he said, well, we've got another job for you. I said, you do? He said, we're moving you to page six. Mm. Uh, he said, because of all the stories that you've broken. And so that's where um, you know, my whole career as a gossip columnist began. And then you know, I got on the Joan Rivers show. Uh, my friend Richard Rubenstein, uh, his dad's Howard Rubenstein, he recommended me for that. And then a lot of tabloid television actually started with hard copy coming down to the post to interview me. Uh, I was on a retainer for hard copy after that, and that's really kind of how the rest of tabloid TV evolved. Um, and so uh, I left the post in 1993 uh, when they were opening and closing, and Murdoch was, you know, had to unload it in one minute due to Calico, and I went to her New York, uh, and they gave me my own column and offered me a lot more money, and I said, well, if it doesn't last long, at least I'll make this little change for the time being. And I elected back then when it closed not to go back to the post. And from there, I became the first African-American woman to have a column in the tabloid. I had the column in the National Examiner. And all the TV, that was the era of the OJ and the Michael mm -hmm. Jackson stuff. So all the TV stuff mm -hmm. kept evolving. And it kind of you know, brings me to where I am today. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very important to be able to break stories Another one of my protégés recently, uh, he's a, a reporter at the Daily News, he was saying that he doesn't really want to write um, 
hard news who wants to write entertainment. I said, well, you got to break some stories. Right. You know, you've got to every single day break some stories. I still pride myself with my radio show. I'm still three days ahead of everybody else mm -hmm. that's out there in mainstream media. And yeah. so you, you really, that's what's important. If you want to be a, a, a real mm -hmm. reporter, not just, you know, somebody, you know, not out there digging. You've got to break stories and mm -hmm. you've got to give them exclusive. Yep. It's very, very important. And go ahead and give her a round of applause. And we're excited to have you, Flo, you know, because she really is a trendsetter in what she's done. So before yeah. there was media takeout, before there was boxing, right. before there was right. the young black and fabulous, she was the original right. black and That's fabulous. That's right. That's right. Great story. As I said, I'm here to support Janine, but I don't mind putting up here with you guys. Thank you for asking me. Right. <laughs> And, and I know each of you, I, I want to know, you know, you mentioned that you were one of few African-American women opening a restaurant in Manhattan at the time. And I guess, and, and for each of you, were you one of few women of color in your fields? And if so, what were some of the challenges you faced along with that in your respective fields? Um, well, <clears throat> yes, definitely. Uh, I always knew I never wanted to work for someone because my father was an entrepreneur, you know, came from really poor background in Louisiana. He was like, look, if you want to make some money, you can't do it for anyone else. You got to do it for yourself. I'm sorry, because there's a glass ceiling right here. And mm -hmm. the man is not going to put you up there. You, you really have to work for your, yourself. And so that gave me the passion to want to start having an entrepreneurial background. Um, it was this, you know, being a black woman in Manhattan where you have white landlords. And the number one thing is if you're African-American, they think you're going to bring an African. Th this is what they said. If you're African American, they don't want a Latina crowd and a black crowd. Believe me, landlords will say, once they come into your restaurant, your restaurant is about to close. I mean, you, you know, when, and it was, it was devastating mm. to hear that landlords would say, or I need $75,000 under the table right now mm. if you want to close this deal. I mean, I have been with landlords saying, wow. slip me an envelope and the number would be 75K on it. I have had landlords say, What's your crowd? I want to meet your family. Who, who do you hang around? Because they feel like once you have a black, once you have a restaurant and black and Latina come, the neighborhood gets scared. Mm. No one wants to come. You know what I mean? I've had, I mean, it was crazy that that's what they would say to you. You know, so you as a, me as a black woman, I had to rise above the ignorance. I had to rise above people telling me that I wouldn't be able to do it in Manhattan. Because right. everyone said, and get, don't get me wrong, I love Harlem and Brooklyn. I love it. Lived in Brooklyn, lived in Harlem, love it. But in Manhattan, it's this arrogance of just go up to 125th, just go down to Fort Greene, just, you know, and stay in Fort Greene, don't come here. And it took me, it took me a year and a half to, uh, to sign the dotted line because landlords, did, once I walked in the room, looked at me funny. Hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, and I made it seven years. I made it through the recession. And I showed my landlord, look, you know what? We can make it with a black crowd, with a Latina crowd, right. with a white crowd. I had all three of them. So I guess my advice to everyone is don't live in the fear. Right. We can live in the fear. I just right. get so angry with that because, no, you are beautiful. Black is amazing. We are amazing, we're smart, we're educated, we can do what others can do. I don't know where we get this whole thing that we're not good enough. We are good enough. Yeah. And yeah, if one has to go through to pave the way for someone else, then let us do it. Because we have to do it. You know? So, Absolutely. I mean. Thank you, Bishon. Thank you, Bishon. Yeah, I, I'm the first African-American anchor on New York One woman. First African-American woman. And uh, through the years, people have tried to derail me. But, you know, I absolutely, through it all, and Naomi knows this, I believe that it is a blessing to be of African descent and not a curse. In my, mo in my bone marrow, I believe that. And as a result, Whenever these things come where people plot to, you know, overthrow you, there's a lot of that that goes on in newsrooms, you know. And it's not really particular to color as much as it is just people want your spot. Get out the way. You 40 now, you know. I'm almost 50 and I'm still rolling in there. So, you know. Okay. 
That's right. Yeah, I'm 47. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and my husband's here with me. I still got him in check. I love it. In his name. Love it. 20, love it. 20 years this year, 20 years. So, Aww. yeah, but you know, we've, my husband knows so many things have gone on when you're sitting in that anchor chair and all kinds of drama and all kinds of, but I'm telling you, it is a blessing to be who we are. It is a blessing and you have to stand in it firm. You can't, like I've seen a lot of people fall for the okie doke. You know what I mean by the okie doke? Somebody they set you up. I tell all of my sisters at New York One, don't fall for the okie doke. They set you up and try to get you to react. And now you acting a fool and going and to complaining to your bosses and your boss is looking at you like, got you. You don't need to complain to nobody. Everybody gets talked about. And it's stop running the, the popularity contest. People ain't going to like you if you sitting there on the anchor set or reporting looking good. Yeah. They're not going to like you. That's just what it is, you know? Just like yourself. If you like yourself, you're going to be all right. Don't look for people to applaud you. You know this, Flo. You worked at the Post of all places. <laughs> if, if, if you're doing your thing, be confident. If somebody tries to cut you, keep moving forward. And people will respect you when you are a survivor. And you don't need people to go, oh, somebody said something about you. Because check this out. When you go complain that somebody is trying to cut your throat or derail you, they go, really? And then they go to their girlfriend and say, girl, guess what she just told me? You ain't got no friends. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm going to keep it 100. When you get in front of that camera, you are a pretty much on your own. That's real talk if you don't believe. You work with a lot of celebrities, and I know they will tell you that. You have a very small pool of people that you could trust, ride or die. Other than that, you better know that people, including people that look just like you, are going to try to take you out. Mm -hmm. So you got to build a shield, stand in faith, stand in confidence, and know what you're doing, and build your integrity, and just keep moving forward. And that's it. That's it. Powerful advice. Powerful advice. I'm loving it. Yeah, that's it. I ain't lying. <laughs> yeah. She said you ain't got no friends. She said you ain't got no friends. You ain't got no friends. Don't have you. any friends. They will try. In his name, that's in his name. You don't have any friends in his name. Hashtag. That's you, ain't got no friends. you ain't got no friends. She said you ain't got no friends. You're right. No, I'm, that's real talk. It is. You don't have no friends is one hashtag. Yeah. And in his name is the next one. That's the truth. Yeah. That's right. Everybody wants your spot. Yep. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And I'm telling you, I'm hearing things about a certain anchor woman right now at a network, and it's breaking my heart because she's violating all the rules. She's going and talking to people. I can't believe this has happened. And that person goes and tells 20 people. And I'm hearing about it at New York One, and I don't even work where she works. You know what I mean? So I'm like, oh, you know, I wish I could talk to her. But, you know, you, mm -hmm. people just got to walk their own journey. Yeah. But you got to play this with precision mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. skill and know that, like, I think about all of my grandmothers who never had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. All of them were maids. And before yeah. that, they were slaves. Yeah. And I owe it to them to stay firmly planted for them. Yeah. It's not really an ego trip. It's like... I am reaping the benefit of their investment. When my grandmothers were on their knees, nope, society told them they could do nothing more than clean toilets their whole lives. So I know that I'm standing in the newsroom with a very special privilege. Like my grandmother's 80, almost 90 years old now, and watches me on TV. And I'm telling you, I sit there knowing that my grandmother is proud of me. Yeah. 
That's about the most important thing to the whole it thing. Is. That my grandmother got to see that, see, Grandma, they were lying to you. You could have done anything. You could have done anything. But Can't Jim Crow it. told you all you could do was scrub and clean. Well, look at granddaughter. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Look yeah. at granddaughter. That's a blessing. Yes, it is a blessing. That's a blessing. I'm good to see you. And can I just go off of her? You know what? In in this world, people are going to talk about you no matter what. Right. When you're doing good, they're going to talk about you. Yeah. When you're on the top, they're going to talk about you. When you're on the bottom, they're going to talk about they're you. They're going to laugh at Misery you. Misery right. loves company. Right. And when you're on the top, they don't want to see you there. Right. So if you really worry about what people are going to say, you will be in the same position mm -hmm. as you were the year after year. You yeah. just keep rising to the top. Keep moving. Believe me. Mm -hmm. Just keep your faith. Keep doing your job. Be dedicated. Be committed. And do what you got to do. There you and go. And rise to the top. It is. That's it. It is. That's it. You can't get distracted. Could yeah. everyone hear Shantae's comment? That is the truth. No. I was just, I was, Brashan had a great point, but you know, as a fellow person who I feel like I'm not even in front of the camera, but I know I'm being talked about all the time because we're just circles back when you know a lot of people, but if you're not doing well, they're talking about you out of amusement. Like, hey girl, this happened. Mm -hmm. But when you're, when you're at the top of your game and they want your spot, they're talking about you out of fear. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it's like, you know, there has to be some other kind of reason why she is that successful other than that she's better than me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. That's, that's just the kind of conversation that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You gotta stay focused. Yeah. Yep. Or she's just good at her craft. Why can't she be excellent at what she does? Right. Why can't we recognize excellence and say, girl, you're doing a good job. You're doing a hell of a job. I'm so, instead of saying, mm, instead of always looking at the negative, right. like it's just time to stop that. You know what? Maybe we can learn something from someone who's doing amazing things. Right. Maybe we can look at what they're doing and mm -hmm. learn. Instead of always looking at the negative, finding a crack in the hole and find something that's beautiful. Right. Find something to say, you know what, let me right. learn. She's doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. Let me follow in her footsteps. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Oprah Winfrey is one that we all can follow in their, her footsteps and say, yeah. she's doing amazing things. Yeah. She's doing it. They said her network wasn't going to make it. And look at it three years now. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Everyone says she wasn't going to make it. She should stop, quit. She's losing billions. But look at her now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> and I, and I, Flo, I will come back to you regarding yeah. challenges you faced. I guess I wanted to follow up in, in terms of people talking and saying this and saying that. Overall, have you had support from other women of color in your industry in terms of what you're doing? Um, or have you faced a lot of adversity, whether it be direct or nasty emails or letters? Mm -hmm. Now we're in the age of social media where someone mm -hmm. can always just tweet, oh, her hair look bad, or that suit don't match, or, you know, I, they, do you find it a, a different playing field now that social media is involved in terms of how people perceive you and the work that you're doing? Right. I've never really too much experienced that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I, I guess I'm about one of the you know, first people that started wearing blonde hair way back, you know, in the 80s, and I used to get a lot of criticism with that. But you know that was really about it. I, I think that because I'm pretty nice to everyone, always been pretty celebrity friendly. I've only mm -hmm. you know had problems, you know, uh, with uh, Whitney uh, Houston, and uh, you know always off and on problems with Spike Lee. Other than that, I've always you know been pretty celebrity friendly with my reporting. So I've never too much had that problem. But uh, Cheryl is correct. I came to the New York Post in 1985, and it was like being in oh. South Africa in the middle of apartheid. Oh, sure. Uh, every single day was a horrible challenge. Mm. It got to the point where a friend of mine that's a minister suggested that I put red flowers in an open Bible uh, and water. I'm being very serious on my workstation every day. And I did. I mean, in fact, somebody said one day, well, why don't you take it to affirmative action? I said, well, I'm the chairman of the affirmative action. <laughs> 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 exactly. Uh, let us all go to NABJ, mm -hmm. uh, the conference out in, in California. So I told one of my colleagues at Daily News, well, y'all can't even fill up a taxi cab, which is true. There were only four of us, you know, African-American working there. In fact, one night I went over to the New York Times.
times with a friend of mine as a photographer. That was back when you turned the film in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'd never seen black people in a newsroom like that. I was like looking at people like they were crazy. But it's still a real challenge out there today to see African Americans in a newsroom. So that's why I encourage right. people to try to be in mainstream media, because uh, it's still not that. But I, I really faced horrific challenges. Yes, you did. <laughs> you know, uh, and because, of, first of all, I was the only person doing what I did. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I never really experienced uh, any bad blood with other journalists or anything, no. Yeah. And what... <laughs> Just to build on that, uh, one of the things I'm really proud of, I never had a real mentor, unfortunately, but to compensate, I am a mentor. So what you don't have, you become. So let me tell you what happened to me last week, and I was really just proud of myself for this. A young, I had been mentoring a young African-American lady. She went to FIT, and she wanted to be a journalist. She didn't really realize you shouldn't go to FIT, but you know, it was done. So by the time she realized that she was in the last year of FIT. So she reaches out to me and I'm like, well, come on in the newsroom, show you around. Here's who you apply to, da da da. They rejected her immediately because she went to FIT. Had all the, nothing was wrong with her, just she went to the wrong school. So if it's a competition between FIT and NYU, guess who wins? Or Columbia. Or Columbia. Or Columbia. Right. Right. They get the job. Exactly. I mean, they I'm get the job. Very, very honest. That's, That's real. Most journalists are hired in mm -hmm. mainstream media. Right. So she she said, Cheryl, I applied three times and I and I said, Well, I I don't know what to tell you. So I'm on the air live when the two buildings come down in East Harlem with Pat Kiernan. And we're live for hours and hours. And they say in my ear, a girl, Mercedes, she should be here. I should have told her about this. They said, Mercedes lives around the corner, and she's going to just give us a phoner until we can get our reporters there. It was the girl who I had been mentoring. This girl acted like, like fire. And I'm like, this, this is familiar in my ear. And I'm like, so what do you see? And I'm, you know, reporting mm -hmm. live with her mm -hmm. because we don't have any boots on the ground yet for my, so she does it for 30 minutes. Wow. Me and Pat Kiernan asking her questions. Then when we finally get our cameras, okay. their crew, boom, there she is on our air. I said, Mercedes, I'm going to type this out for you in an email cut and paste it and send it to this person, this person, this person, say that you were on the team for New York One, they didn't give you a shot, you proved your, your chops live on the air when we had no place else to turn. They brought her in the next week, she oh, got the job. That's so good. That's, 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 that's a good right. story. Right. That's right. an excellent that's story. story. Yep. That's an excellent story. But see, that's what I'm saying. That's what we have to do as black women. We got to support and encourage our young sisters coming behind us. You know what I mean? And keep the door open. Don't close it behind you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as we wrap up, I did want to ask about mentorship. You said you did not have a mentor, but no. you reach out to others. No. For Flo and Bershawn, did you have someone that was kind of helping you through the hoops, whether they are of, of color or not? And what are you doing to reach out to other young women? Well, I had a lot of mentors, actually. As I, I mentioned, the great Ophelia DeVore, I, mm -hmm. when I came here, um, I just happened to go over to, I, well, I really wanted to act and stuff, so I went over there and then they said, oh, you could write and stuff, so I ended up kind of doing publicity for Grace Del Marco and Ophelia DeVore, and so she took me under wing. Also, the legendary Cindy Adams, she's a white woman, but mm -hmm. I owe a lot of my career to her. Yeah. Joan Rivers, I owe a lot of my career to. And, you know, uh, Geneva's one of my protégés, um, Michael Feeney, uh, John Murray. Mm -hmm. I, I help young uh, women and men. I mm -hmm. think it is very important to embrace young people. Um, and I try to kind of school them on everything. I mean, I even try to help Naomi Campbell. To work <laughs> her. I like talking to young people and say, you know, you need to do this and that. That's just, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, um, I had a lot of college professors and a lot of aspirational coaches and authors, which helped me uh, want to help women. So I speak at homeless shelters around town. I've been doing it for like six years, just going to them, giving an hour uh, every other Monday, giving back, teaching them about, you know, success out there, getting your resume together, you know, not being afraid because they're sort of afraid of coming into the real world and people seeing them as homeless and, and, and they're not good enough. 
and just I help encourage them, telling them that they are enough and they could get into the world and get into media and, and social media and technology and things like that. So I think it's always good to help others because it helps yourself. Yep. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, oh, go ahead. Give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> we have received some incredible expert advice from these ladies today. Don't you all agree? They really shared some powerful <laughs> advice with us. Uh, that we can take forward with us and, and reach out to someone else and help them along the way. Even if you're just getting started, you have some knowledge that you can share with someone else about why it didn't work or how to do it better next time. So mm -hmm. thank you so much, ladies. And I do want to open up the floor to any questions at this time from the audience for our panelists. Hello, my name is Eric Hatfield. I know we were talking today a lot about reaching out and mentorship. My background is primarily in corporate America and communications mm -hmm. and media. And pretty much until I moved to New York, I never worked with anyone of color my whole career. So I guess my question to you is how do you approach someone and say, I like what you're doing, I like your work, can you mentor me? And how to kind of foster that relationship without it looking like I'm trying to come for your job? Mm. I get, I'd like to answer, I get about five to 10 emails a day yeah. uh, with young people asking me to mentor them. And I, I do answer all of them back. Yeah. Uh, I think if you just email people, um, you know, another mentor of mine was uh, Janet Langhart Cohen, who was you know, probably one of the most beautiful, you know, African women, American women to ever be on television, yep. you know. So, I mean, I, I, uh, I think she approached me though, when I was just coming up and, and said she'd like help. So I think you can send people emails and ask people questions. I, I think that everyone is glad to reach out. And I don't think that's something you should be afraid of or timid about. Yeah. And Flo, this is Ashley. I'll follow up to that to say that I have been one to reach out before to, to folks that I might have looked up to. And that was after they said, well, hit me up, send me an email, and didn't hear back. Mm. So, so what happens then, and, and not just one time, you know, mm. you might have sent another follow-up, not to be a nuisance or not to be a burden. You might have waited another couple weeks or maybe even a couple months to say, hey, you know, we met at such and such and, you know, suggested we be in touch. You know, can we meet for coffee and you don't hear back? And I know that professionals who are at the top of their game are busy. I get it. Everyone's busy. They all have things going on. But how do you take that when someone doesn't reply back to you after you've asked them to, to reach out, like to be Cheryl a mentor? Like Cheryl said, you keep it moving yeah, and go on to the next Yeah, you can. Nothing you can do. <laughs> you go on to Nothing the next you can do. Just keep it moving. Yeah, yeah, because you'll, you'll trip yourself up if you get angry. Then it's like, I'm glad I didn't call you back. You know, if, you, if you're nasty when somebody doesn't get back to you, that's not a good move. I would just keep following up every so many months. You know what I mean? People hit me on Facebook all the time, and I always make it a point to respond. And, uh, you know, I have business cards with me. You know, like the sister that just said that, you know, I always bring people into the newsroom. It's my pleasure. And I follow up in any way I can. I can never do lunches or, you know, people always like, can I take you off a coffee? I'm like, well, that is something I don't, you know, no journalist really can do that because that's just too much. But I can bring you in when I'm working, when I know it's slow, and we can talk there. And I just grab people, put them in the conference room, and we brainstorm about how to get their career on track or whatever. I'm always happy to do that. Sometimes I'll bring in five at a time. And, you know, whatever I could do to share wisdom or give them contacts, I do. I got just the opposite the other week. I, was, I did a book signing in Philadelphia the other week, and a lady asked me, she said her daughter wants to be in PR, this mm -hmm. and that. So I said, well, have her call me, because a friend of mine had on Facebook, he's looking for an intern. Right. So the girl did call me last week, and I said, okay, great, send me your resume, you know, and I'll forward to you. Now, if you all got that resume, so did I. So, you know, it's just the opposite. She didn't follow Right. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Melissa Rawlings from Queens, and I have, I currently have a radio show in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, The Nest featuring Zorbert. Mm -hmm. I've had a column and I've also worked on television doing on-camera reporting. But at this point, next week I will be 30 <coughs> years old. <laughs> and I'm just wondering at this point, am I shooting myself in the foot by doing these different things? Because I feel like all the time it's not, I know exactly how to present myself or what it is that I want besides just saying media. 
I want to be in media, I am in media, and this is what I want mm -hmm. to do. But I'm wondering, uh, in your opinion, do you think that I am turning myself around by being a little bit everywhere too much? Well, you know what, yeah, you're one I gave my card. Yes. Come to the newsroom, we're going to talk. Okay. But um, I would need to look at what you've done, okay. and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Yeah, and so, I, and I, we I have a date, so. Right. Yeah, I, has jobs, so they right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. We need to pass those blessings on. So I was just trying to get a toe in the door, not the whole foot, a toe. Right. To do. So I was just looking for uh, this advice from you, but thank you. Yeah, no, we'll talk. And, uh, you know, why, the reason I want to look at what you've done is I want to know did you just graduate from school or whatever and are you trying to make a leap into being on camera because if that's what it is then that could be why you're having difficulty i've done it in school i double major creative writing and journalism but what was your path to you know what did you do after uh, i worked uh, i worked uh, in, in mokata museum i worked with transit transit television okay i worked different uh, uh -huh. places with uh -huh. media anywhere uh -huh. they said that it would tie in or link in maybe uh -huh. the company wasn't uh, some kind of media company, mm -hmm. but I tried to work in that capacity sure. there uh, to put a lot of nonprofit black women, minority owned companies. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, I would think, my number one out of mm -hmm. nonprofit. But just something to always uh, stay in the media to show, uh, you know, children, young women, black mm -hmm. people coming mm -hmm. into the field that, you know, they can do it. Uh, I'm right. trying to do it, and we're all in struggle together. A lot of mm -hmm. times I would bring in other people so we can all struggle together. Which right. You know? Right, well, no. With all of that, you should have a pretty good clip file. Right. Like TV, radio, and all of that. Right. You need to put all that together on real. Okay. You know, right. Most Cheryl, like she said, okay. uh, very generously offering you. Okay. And put that together on real and, and you know, go into human resources and different companies and see who's looking for jobs and just keep sending Same it out. Right. Yeah. You're not going to get a job if you don't try to, you right. know, go out there to find it. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. You know, but we'll talk. Important. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And we want to remind the folks who are watching us via live stream to tweet your questions to Black Women in Media. But check out the 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 at symbol there, B L K W M N in Media. So be sure to tweet questions if you have them as well. Are there any more for our audience? One more here. Um, I have a comment. I'm in finance, and so I'm not in media. But my mother. Um, as a journalist, and I did an internship at Essence um, straight out of FIT a while ago. So I have a lot of exposure, and I know the importance of communication. So I just wanted to thank you all for having this. Um, I think this is a great networking event. I actually saw and found out about this because I was looking at the, I want to pronounce your name, the Nigerian powerhouses. I was looking at your information, your Facebook. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I follow you on Instagram, and you are my inspiration in the gym, so power to you. So yeah, I just want to say thank you. Um, I've taken a lot of what you've said in terms of being in media and staying anchored because um, in finance, being in the city, uh, being in, on Wall Street, um, I'm a banker, I've come from different uh, backgrounds, and to your point, as far as our legacy and our DNA, uh, when I was studying for my uh, securities licenses to do mutual funds and some stocks and bonds, it occurred to me how powerful it was to be let in to yes. the room, to learn how to, you know, operate the economy and find out these secrets. Mm -hmm. When we were the economy at some point on Wall Street, we were the chattel. And to have that opportunity to then, you know, be in certain arenas where I'm the only black girl that I feel like they've ever come in contact and then wow. I'm trying to sell myself so that they trust me with their money and their legacy wow. and their estate is so deep to me. So the fact that you all have humbled yourselves to share that part of your stories, it, it really means a lot. So I just want to say thank, thank you. Thank you. And one more question. Thank you. Um, hi, Cheryl. How are you? Good to see you. Nice to um, see ladies, you. you are an inspiration. So my name is Kashana Evans. So the question slash comment, and you as well, which... Brashana. Yes, I'll, I'll give you a hug and hello in a minute. Um, but I wanted to kind of, I guess it's a comment. It could, it could be rhetoric or whatever it is, but you're, you're a powerful team up there, and I have to say it out loud, in this room. 
So I recently was at the, you know, in January, digging through all of the conventions, trade shows, um, media events like this, so that I can really stay on my A game this year. Right. And uh, I came across a Forbes Women event, and I thought, wow, this looks really interesting. I'm ready to learn. Uh, my my company is Kissing Lions Public Relations. Mm. So I was like, this is for me. Look at all these great things. Mm. So it just said, click this button, and you're invited. You can come. So I clicked the button, and I said, oh. I'm really excited, I'm gonna be smarter this year and I'm gonna be better. So I got an email response from Forbes Women Event confirming that I could join. So shortly after, I got another email saying, we're so sorry, you don't qualify to come to the event, but good luck. And so what I really wanna say is that oh the 10 years that I studied healing and wellness and then rolling all of that into media, the background I have in fashion entertainment, all of that stuff, it doesn't matter. If you can't be in a room like this and bring each other up and know each other's websites and tweet and hashtag, you will be on the bottom of someone's shoe until you are in the grave, whether we say we are free or not. And it gave me such an experience. I'm shaking as I say it, because I was like, you guys just wait. I'm gonna make you write about me first and then I'm gonna tell you about yourself. <laughs> so, you. you know, I just wanted to say that and I would love to just hear the echoed um, empowerment words you have for that. And I'm just really in appreciation to be here. Oh, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Are there any final remarks from uh, Flo Anthony, Cheryl Wills, or Bershawn Shaw as we wrap out this panel of our pioneers? Oh, you know, I wanted to uh, commend uh, Shantae uh, congratulations, uh, congratulate on her award. And I want to say, you know, I, I get hundreds and hundreds of press releases every day. But the fact you send out the photographs, you send out the, the, uh, the copy, you do a tremendous job. And you have a great deal to be proud of. And you do a Yeah, it, yeah, she's amazing. She, she's working with the, the show. She's yeah. amazing at what she does. Her and the team, Tamar and everyone on the team, thank you guys are amazing. But I just want to tell everyone, I think you have to do the work. I think someone said, I don't know her name, but you know, I'm doing radio, TV, all of that. I think put it all together. Who cares? Right. Do the work and don't give up. I don't think you have to um, stop at one thing, you know what I mean? If you're good, just get it out there. That's how, you know, I was doing YouTube videos, I was doing blogs, I was writing until a producer heard me speak at Johns Hopkins University. That's how I got in this and told me, you know, wanted to pitch me to speak somewhere else, then told me to speak at Safeway, then wanted me to speak at BJ's, and then sort of I got this whole, you know, domino effect of public speaking and life coaching. So I think you have to just get out there and do the work and don't be afraid to knock on doors and don't be scared. Because you are wonderful and do what you do. <laughs> Hashtag don't be scared. Hashtag. Hashtag. In his name. In his name. <laughs> in his name. He didn't give us a spirit of fear. Exactly. That's right. Yes, ma'am. That's right. And this will be our last comment. Hi, everyone. My name is Nabila. I'm an intern for Shante Bacon. And I just want to thank you all for having this event because it means a lot to me, everything that each of you all said is helpful for me. Um, interning and working for Shantae is really great for me because it's like she's a mentor and I know that me interning with her, I'm learning so much and she gives it to you so real and it's no shorts. Like you have to work hard and do what you have to do. And I, I'm just thankful for the opportunity because I didn't really have that in, in high school, right. in college, I didn't have it. so. I didn't know how, I knew, I always knew that I wanted to be in the media industry, I just didn't know how. Like my friend and I would go to 106 and Park every ch chance we got. I didn't know how, but I knew that being in media, that was what I wanted to do, some type of way. And interning, it just like, it just, especially at 135th Street, it's like a whole nother world and it's like, I'm just so thankful to have that, to be able to learn, to be able to work with other women, to be able to develop myself in so many different ways. And I'm just like, I don't know, I'm Nabila. Oh, okay. I didn't say it. Smith, Nabila Smith, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you all, I really appreciate it.
Thank you, Nabila. And, and the last thing that I do want to bring up is something that uh, Nabila mentioned is really, even if you don't have a, a relationship with someone you would like to be your mentor, like if you can't meet them for lunch or can't chat with them by email, there are a lot of mentors that are indirect as well. Like I, Sean Robinson is one of my favorite hosts in the world. And I actually did get to meet her and tell her that she was, but she's on the West Coast. So it's not like we can just meet up and, and kick it. But there are things I learned from her through her presence, just watching her host. I learned from her skills. I learned from how she interacts with people on social media. Everything she does is positive and uplifting. Mm. When she puts out a word on the day on her page, it's something that's going to make you think. It's something that's going to make you pass it on and be positive. So there are a lot of ways, especially you ladies as well. You've been indirect mentors to me whether or not you have known it. So there are people that really watch you and look at what you do. So realize that as well, that mentorship can also be indirect as well. Any final words? Sherilyn Oh, I just want to say go forward in, in faith mm -hmm. and in confidence, ladies. You're beautiful, and don't let anybody take that away from you. Amen. Amen. Let's give our pioneers a round of applause. <laughs> yes, let's give them a round of applause, Thank please. You. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, y'all. And the four o'clock hour is upon us at this time. Go feel free to take a break. We're going to take a quick break, get your drinks, and just a